Hi guys, welcome back to 38 Smiles. Today we have Dr. Michael Detola, session two on reverse preparation technique. So we're really excited to learn more about that. So take it away, Dr. Detola. Thank you, Mia. This is one of my favorite things to talk about. I love talking about uh, crown preparations. And I think one of the reasons I, I love talking about it so much is I had to learn how to do this the right way, uh, the hard way. I was not born knowing how to prep teeth and it was nothing that came naturally. And for me, it was practicing inside of a dental laboratory for 15 years with technicians that taught me that I was a, a chronic under prepper. I used to under prep teeth probably for the first 15 years of my career. And it wasn't until I started um, working on technicians and with technicians. And when the technicians got comfortable enough with me to tell me that my prep sucked, then all of a sudden I knew things had to get a little bit better, but I didn't know how to make them better. So I just started to research old dental textbooks and anything I could find on different prep techniques. And I, I was looking for something that met a couple of goals. Um, I wanted predictable reduction. And I knew it was going to need to be through the use of depth cuts, so I would know how much I reduced depending on whatever kind of uh, crown preparation I was doing. And I was really bad at doing margins. Like I could do a buckle margin pretty well, and then the mesial and distal would look okay, but by the time it got to the lingual margin, it would disappear. And typically on the distal lingual, my lingual margin and my distal margin would miss each other by about a millimeter, and so they wouldn't even connect all the way. So I, I needed to find a way where nearly perfect margin formation was going to be incredibly easy to do because I wasn't born with a great set of hands. Uh, my brain works pretty well, uh, but the hands, you know, it's that connection between the brain and the hands. And so rather than, you know, hoping or praying that I would wake up one day with a lot of talent in my hands, I decided I need to find another way to get the same results as really talented dentists get. Because in the end, it really doesn't matter as a dentist how much talent you have. It's just about how much you care because the steps I'm going to show and share with your viewers today, it doesn't matter what your talent level is. You can get the same results as the most talented dentist without having to have a ton of talent in your hand. So whether or not you were born with talent doesn't matter. It's simply just kind of an excuse for not trying a little bit harder. For example, this prep that you see here, the central incisor, I should never be able to prep that with my left hand and I couldn't for the first 10 or 15 years of my career at least not um, consistently or if you look at this anterior prep from the side you see three distinct planes you see a gingival third a middle third and then you see that incisal third and how it's prepped back towards the palatal again towards the lingual and that's one of the big mistakes I used to make on on anterior um, preparations like this was to have Bucky Beaver preparations where the incisal third was still kicked out to the facial. And if you haven't removed enough tooth structure, there's just no way that any technician can give you an aesthetic restoration back. And so it's difficult to visualize. And once you see an ideal prep, you can draw it, but then to go in the mouth and actually do it can be difficult uh, to replicate unless you're very artistic. And I wasn't. So I had to find something that was more like if you remember paint by numbers you know for those of us who are artistically challenged you would get a a scene and then you could paint with the colors and the different numbers and make it look halfway decent well this is my version of that this is prep by numbers and this is without being really skilled how you can prep and get the same kind of results now i really don't care what depth cutters any dentist use it's not like i invented these and I'm not a commission from Kerr Rotary for these depth cutters. These just happen to be the ones that I've used for the last 15 years. And so I'm very comfortable with them. And they're called MADC burrs, MADC. And there's four of them. One of them, six tenths of a millimeter uh, depth cutter. One of them's a millimeter and then a 1.5 millimeter and a two millimeter depth cutter. So this pretty much covers everything from 0 0.6 millimeters is the minimum material thickness to do a solid zirconia crown on a molar, for example. So if you've got a fractured second molar, like a mandibular second molar and a short clinical crown, you can get away with doing a zirconia crown that's six tenths of a millimeter thick, but only if you use a depth cutter so you actually know you've reduced six tenths of a millimeter. And if it is that thin, you can adjust the occlusion on that. You've got to adjust the opposing tooth. And your expectation needs to be that it's not going to look like a crown because you haven't reduced enough. It's going to look like a tooth colored thimble on the tooth. But at least the patient 
doesn't have to have a gold crown. You know, unless they want gold, then by all means, do gold because that's the best restorative material we've ever had. I just find a lot of patients who don't want it. One millimeter is actually the ideal thickness for solid zirconia or the preferred thickness. It's the minimum material thickness for lithium disilicate materials like Emax. 1.5 millimeters is actually the ideal thickness for an Emax restoration in case you have to make any inclusal adjustments. And then two millimeters is what we used to use for bilayered restorations like porcelain fused to metal or porcelain fused to zirconia. And today in dentistry, the good news is we don't often have to reduce two millimeters, although we, we often will on the incisal ledge of like a maxillary anterior tooth to give our technician as much room as possible to create a beautiful incisal edge. So when we're using these depth cutting burrs, one principle we wanna keep in mind is that the burr is always perpendicular to the tooth surface. So you can see that the burr is at a 90 degree angle on this slide to the tooth surface itself. So whether you're making a depth cut in the central groove where the burr would be straight up and down, or it's gonna be slanted to match the angle of the occlusal surface like it is here, or I like to put my depth cuts into the cuss tip itself. So again, I'm holding the burr straight up and down when I do that. And the nice things about these depth cutting burrs, as opposed to say a 330 burr, is that there's a shoulder on the burr. So when you push the burr into the tooth, it stops in this case at two millimeters and won't go any deeper, which is a very accurate way to be able to make a depth cut. I was taught in school to use a 330 burr to place depth cuts, but you can go too shallow or you can go too deep because there's no stop on the burr that tells you when you're at um, the right depth. And that's the reason why um, I use depth cutting burrs instead of just using a 330 burr. If, if we're going to do this, let's be accurate about it. Let's not use depth cuts and then guess with a 330 burr. Furthermore, 330 burrs from one company to another all differ just a little bit in terms of how long the cutting blades are on the burr itself. So it should be totally standardized, but it's not totally standardized. So um, you're better off using a depth cutter of a known dimension that's got a stop on it. So let me walk you through the steps. Oftentimes I show um, a video uh, of this preparation technique being done on an anterior tooth where it's a little easier to visualize. And I'll give you guys a link you can put on your website so that anybody who wants to see the video of this being done clinically can see it as well, but considering that um, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis and everybody, um, it's a little daring to try to stream a video right now, so I'll just show you with them some still pictures how this goes. So the first thing we're gonna do, like with just about any prep technique, is we're just gonna use a 56 carbide burr to break the contact. So we're gonna break the, and I'll show you on a posterior tooth. This, these illustrations will be on a posterior tooth. And this is the best place to start, by the way, when you do this technique for the first time, is to do it on a molar um, where you're doing it because it's really much easier to see what happens. It's, it's I'd say, slightly more complicated on an anterior tooth, although not much more so. Uh, but on a posterior tooth, it's really easy to visualize what you're doing. So we're going to break the contest with a 56 burr. So that's step one on the mesial and the distal. And the reason we're breaking contact uh, on this tooth is for step two, is we're going to place a retraction cord. And the retraction cords that I use, I like the ultra pack cords from Ultradent. They're they're hollow braided cords, even though our illustrator makes this look like a, a solid cord. The ultra pack cords from Ultradent are hollow. I always start with a size double zero, uh, zero, zero. They also make a triple zero that's even a smaller cord. But for me, it's, it's kind of too difficult to manipulate. And I just haven't found a gingival sulcus yet that the double zero cord won't fit into. Most of the time you can just hold it in your fingers and floss it into place on the mesial and floss it into place on the distal. And then you're just going to pack it on the buccal and lingual. We're going to cut the two loose ends of the cord so that when we pack them down together, they're not going to be overlapping each other. They're just going to come together and the ends will meet. And we want to do that so we don't take up too much room in the sulcus because at the very end of this prep technique, we're going to put a second cord on top typically a size two cord, but we'll talk about that when we get there. So this double zero cord, which is purple in this illustration that you see here, again, it's a very small cord, but it uh, notably has not been soaked in any medicament. There's no epinephrine strand in it or anything like that. It's just a plain cord, uh, just cotton that hasn't been touched with anything else. And as soon as we break the contacts, 
we're going to put that cord into place and that's going to retract our gingiva vertically uh, about half a millimeter on average. And so by retracting the uh, gingiva vertically, that's going to allow us to place our margin uh, without nicking the gingiva, knowing that when that we remove that double zero cord, the gingiva is going to rebound that half millimeter. So it's going to give us uh, a margin on our preparation that's slightly subgingival, but we haven't had to take any burr subgingival. Um, one of the biggest um, enemies of trying to take a great impression is bleeding or moisture in the sulcus. So we don't want to touch a burr to the gingiva. So at this step, we're going to put the double zero cord in. It's going to pull the gingiva down towards the apex of the tooth. And that's going to allow us to prep the margin, knowing that when we take that out, that the gingiva is, is going to uh, rebound. And so we'll have a slightly subgingival margin. This is really important in the anterior for anterior, say, Emax crowns where we want to hide where the crown and the tooth come together. In the posterior, not as big of a deal because patients don't, can't look at the, these margins in their rear view mirror at a traffic light. So this, that's critically important on, on anterior teeth. So we're going to pack this double zero cord into place and get that vertical retraction. And by the way, that vertical retraction is just for us as dentists to place the margins. Laboratory technicians don't care. It does nothing for them, that vertical retraction. What we have to get for laboratory technicians is lateral retraction of the tissue away from the tooth. That's what's really important. And, we're, and you can't do that with a single cord. That's really why the one cord technique doesn't work that well. Uh, for me, it's either got to be a two cord technique or a diode laser to trough the gingiva. But we'll get to that second cord later. So the double zero cord goes into place in the sulcus. And what's the, once that is in place, all the way packed down there, now we're going to prep our margin. And so that's why I call this the reverse preparation technique, because it's the exact opposite of what I was taught to do in dental school, which is you prep the entire tooth, and at the very end, you prep the margin. I found that incredibly difficult to do, and I still do. I've been a dentist now for 33 years, and I still think that's the hardest way to prep a tooth. But meanwhile, that's the way every dentist in every dental school is taught to do it. And it's unfortunate because it works really well for the five or 10% of the dentists who have really great hands, but it doesn't work so well for the other, say 90% of the dentists. And I'm here to tell you, if you haven't tried this before, prepping the margin very on is the third step. All we do is break contacts, place a cord, and boom, we're going straight to the margin. And the reason why this is so easy is because all the hard tooth structure is still there on the tooth. We're also gonna use a burr that most dentists haven't seen before for this kind of use, and it's that round diamond that you see on the screen. And this round diamond, that shape is an 801. So when you see uh, burr names, 801 refers to the shape. So 801 is a round ball diamond like that. And then the diameter is how wide the burr is at its widest point. So if this is an 801-021 burr, for example, the first three numbers of the shape, the second three numbers of the size, that would mean this burr is 2.1 millimeters across at its widest point. That's what we used to use back in the PFM days or the porcelain fused zirconia days, like a lava crown. We would use that 021 burr that's 2.1 millimeters across. The good news is this same burr with the same shape also comes in an 018, which is 1.8 millimeters wide, comes in an 016, and an 014, which is 1.4 millimeters wide. So regardless of whether I'm prepping solid zirconia or let's say I was prepping a PFM, I'm always using this burr at this step, but I'm just, pick, I'm just picking a different diameter based on how conservative I'm going to be with my preparation. So if this is going to be a solid zirconia crown on this molar, I can use that 014 or that 016 round burr and make a smaller margin because the burr is not as wide in terms of diameter. Usually with smaller margins, we worry about a laboratory technician being able to see the margin, but this round burr gives you such a definite margin that even with the smaller sizes, your lab technician will be able to see it. So what we do, we've got our bottom cord in place, the and we're going to go from the mesial lingual line angle along the, buck, along the lingual to the distal lingual line angle. And basically, you're trying to hold the shank of the burr as vertical to the long axis of the tooth as you can. You have to tip it over a little bit like you see on this illustration because the head of the handpiece, which you don't see in the illustration, because of the width of the head of the handpiece, you have to tilt it over a little bit. But that's fine. It still works fine. And then we're going to take it over to the buckle. The round burr most of the time won't fit on the mesial and the distal. 
If it does, feel free to carry it through there. But most of the time to take that rounder through the inner proximal, you would be hitting the adjacent tooth. And I'm assuming you're not prepping the adjacent tooth on either side. We're just talking about one single preparation. So you're gonna do the lingual margin with that round burr. And if it won't fit in approximately, then you're gonna take it over to the buckle and go from the distal buckle to the mesial buckle or the opposite, it doesn't matter. And you can do the buckle before the lingual. Half of the depth of that burr into it, which gives you a half circle or a C-shaped preparation at the margin. This accomplishes two things. This not only gives us our gingival depth cut that we need for this restoration, but that C shape, that half circle margin, by the time we do the axial reduction and get rid of the top half of that circle, you can see the circle has already been cut on this illustration over on the side. By the time we do the axial reduction, we're now left with a quarter circle, and that's kind of the perfect chamfer margin. So the depth of that margin is just determined by how big, how wide the diameter of that round burr, round burr is. And in cases where you can't fit the round burr in approximately on the mesial and distal, don't worry, that's still connected by that 56 burr that we did in there. We're still gonna go in and smooth up the gingival margin. But this is how you get nearly perfect margins every time. There's no easier way to prep a margin. I've tried everything to get a great margin and I found nothing easier than using this round burr and using it early in the technique like we're doing here. I, I just have to call it dummy proof just from my own dumb hands and my ability to get a good result with this. It's very unique. I got this idea out of a 1940s prosthodontic textbook that I saw back when they were using steel burrs and belt driven hand pieces um, to use this for the margin. It's the only time I've ever seen it referred to in a prep and I tried it one day in the operatory on some unsuspecting technician who was my, my patient. I looked down with my mirror at the end of my prep and I was blown away by how good it looked because I had never prepped a margin that good before. And it was that shock that I got of, oh my God, look what I just did, how did I do it? Where I learned that this was the key to the technique. So any viewers today, if you're just gonna take one thing from this webinar, it'd be using this round bird to prep the margin and prep it early in the prep technique. Once we've done our margin um, reduction with the round burr, now we can go to placing our depth cuts. I usually place um, two depth cuts in the central groove, one in the mesial pit, one in the distal pit. And then I'm gonna place depth cuts in the buccal cuss tips and the lingual cuss tips. If this feels like too much work to you and you just wanna skip one of them, you, I, I guess skip the buccal cuss tip. You know, you can still have the patient bite together and put the mirror in and pull their cheek away and see the buccal cuss tip. But the thing that drives us nuts in the lab is how dentists think they can, you know, have the patient bite together, pull the cheek back and visualize what's going on with the lingual cusps. And that's where nine out of 10 times the under reduction is. It's rarely on the buccal cusp of a molar. It's always the lingual cusp of a molar. Because unless you have x-ray vision or some insane, if you're the terminator and you have some micrometer in your eye where you can measure reduction and see through, it's basically 100% humidity. It's like raining in the back of the mouth. It's this dark and you're trying to pull the cheek away far enough. It's crazy to think you could see how much you reduced on the lingual cuss tip. So at least do that, but just do the buckle ones while you're there too. And after we've placed our occlusal reduction, then we need to do our axial reduction. So again, we're gonna take our depth cutting burr and hold it at a 90 degree angle. And we're gonna go right to the height of contour or just above where that round burr depth cut is for the gingival third. And just above there, we place one of these depth cuts on the buckle and one of them on the lingual. And now this is basically what we have. We have a prep with a bunch of holes in it. Let's say this is gonna be one millimeter on the occlusal surface and probably one millimeter on the buckle and lingual. And we've already prepped our margin. And so now all I have to do is connect all the dots. So to me, these depth cuts are like having GPS or having ways in your handpiece because now you're going to know when you're done prepping. I remember the first 15 years of my career, I'd be prepping a crowd going, I wonder if I'm done. I'll just go around two or three more times. Yeah, that feels like enough. And then I would stop. It was very random to know when I should stop prepping a tooth, but it's different here. I know when I'm done because I can't see the depth cuts anymore. And by the way, to see these depth cuts, they will fill up with water coming from the handpiece. So you have to have your assistant take the air water syringe and dry off the preparation to see if the depth cuts are still there. But now we have our, our GPS, we have our roadmap in place. So we're going to use an 856-025 burr. 856 is the shape of this burr. And again, 025 is the diameter of this burr at its widest point. And we just need to connect the dots here. So we're gonna start with the occlusal reduction 
and we're going to hold the burr at an angle that parallels the slope of the cusp tips and then we just set the burr onto it set it spinning and then you know push the burr down till we get through all the depth cuts you'll have to stop two maybe three times have your assistant dry it off and see if there's any depth cuts left i know when i first started using this technique it would be five or six times uh that where i'd sure i'd be done and i have my assist i tell my assistant jennifer i say okay i think we're done and she'd dry off the tooth and i'd see there was still depth cuts there and i had to go farther and farther and that's because i was a chronic under prepper um, so my tendency was always to to under reduce so we're going to reduce um half of the occlusal table and then flip the burr over and do the other half i happen to use electric hand pieces because i love the torque that they have um, these you can do these cuts very quickly with an electric hand piece they've got a ton of torque you can also turn the rpms down and slow it down so you're not creating um, as much heat but we use that 856025 burr um, works great it's got a big surface area on it it supports its own weight well i love cutting with large diameter burrs they're much more stable on the surface of the tooth and we're using coarse or even super coarse grits on this and and if your viewers go and watch the video it shows you the names and the numbers of all the burrs in case you're furiously trying to write them down all of these burrs we're going to be using are either coarse or super coarse burrs till we get to the till we get to the very end but you can see the reduction that we've done here on the occlusal table and then we're going to take the 856025 burr again and we're just going to go in and use it to get rid of our axial depth cut so to prep down to where that axial depth cut is there's taper built into these burrs into this 856 shape so you basically are just trying to hold um, the handpiece and the burr parallel to the long axis of the tooth and it will give you enough reduction it'll give you a taper of around eight to ten degrees um, the cements we have today we don't need to have quite as a retentive a prep as we did, you know, when I was in dental school and we're using Duralon as a permanent cement. So even if you end up with 12, 15, you know, 18 degrees for a preparation. So to finish off this preparation, we're going to use the same burr, this 856025 burr, but I'm going to use it in a fine grit, an 856025F. It'll have a red stripe on it. It's got 60 micron particles on it. It's going to make this margin very, very smooth because even though solid zirconia can handle maybe some chips out of the margin, lithium disilicate, Emacs, and the others cannot handle that. Remember, your digital laboratory now will be blowing up your margins and looking at it digitally. They're going to be able to see things that you can't see. You have to trust me that, it, well, you know it. If you've done digital scans of your preps, you've seen the roughness at the margin. Take that fine grit burr, that red stripe burr, and smooth off that gingival margin. Once we've smoothed that off, we're ready for our pre-impression technique. So we're going to start smoothing off any rough angles we have, um, mainly because if you see a 90 degree angle like you see here, there's no milling machine on the planet that can replicate a sharp angle like that. So it has to over mill to make sure the crown will seat. But when it over mills, it might make the crown too thin. So round off any sharp angles you have on the occlusal surface as we're doing here. Just use a sandpaper disc. That's typically the easiest way to do it. And then we're going to put our top cord in, the second cord in our two cord technique. This is a size two cord from Ultradent. I use a 2E where the E stands for epinephrine. I started doing this after I heard Gordon Christensen say at a lecture that he uses epinephrine on the top cord to prevent bleeding, since this is going to be a critical component in sending a great impression to our dental laboratory. So we pack that 2E cord in place on top of the double zero cord. So we have two cords in the sulcus now. And then we're going to place an anatomical copper cap on top of this and you can see this is basically a concentric cotton roll that has a cut out of it for the papilla and so in the old days the copper caps used to come straight across and they would place too much pressure on the papilla and not enough pressure on the facial and lingual gingiva to help hold that cord in place and help the cord do its retraction so now that we have this anatomical cut out uh, on the copper caps they come that way from the factory you place it into place and the patient bites down on it and the cotton roll is going to do a couple things it's going to make sure the cord stays in place so the patient doesn't play with it with their tongue or dislodge it and it's also going to put pressure on this gingiva and it's kind of like if you cut your finger with a knife while you're slicing um, a bagel while you're 
cooking now that everybody's cooking all their meals at home. I bet the number of knife cuts has gone up by like 3,000% in the last four <laughs> weeks. If you cut yourself with a knife, how do you get it to stop bleeding? You don't just stare at it. You take a towel or a rag and you put pressure on it to stop the bleeding. And that's what we're doing here with the Compra Cap. We're going to put pressure on that gingiva. So we've done three things here to keep this from bleeding. We've put two cords in so that we're only taking one out at the end. The top cord has epinephrine in it. Epinephrine stops bleeding, as every dentist knows. And we're also getting pressure hemostasis by having the patient bite down on that compra cap for eight to 10 minutes. Why eight to 10 minutes? Because we tried it for four minutes and it wasn't long enough. And we've had patients do it for 15 minutes and it didn't get any better. So it's kind of a guesstimate, but eight to 10 minutes seems to work well. It's also roughly the amount of time it takes to go to another operatory and do a hygiene check by coincidence. So patient bites on it for eight to 10 minutes. Remember to keep that copper cap moist, especially if we have a vital tooth. We don't want to dry the tooth out. That can lead to post-operative sensitivity. So we're moistening that with water before we put it into place. It's not about it being dry to stop the bleeding. In fact, the drier that copper cap is, the more it might stick to the gingiva and start bleeding when you take it off. So make sure it's moist while it's in place and the patient's biting down. And then eight to, eight to 10 minutes later, uh, we remove it, uh, the top cord, that green one, and we flow the impression material into the sulcus um, with that double zero cord still in place. But when that double zero cord comes out from the base of that sulcus, that's when the bleeding will happen. We don't want to happen right before we take the impression. So there's reverse preparation technique works really well for me. You can use it anytime you're prepping a crown for the first time, Mia, but there are times a lot of what dentists do, like 60% of what dentists do are replacing an old crown with a new one. In those cases, you can't use the depth cutters because you don't know how much the previous dentist reduced. So one last tip that I want to give to your viewers are these prep sure crown prep guides from a company called contact easy. And uh, I know you guys as a laboratory, really every lab would love to just give their dentists 10 or 15 sets of these, because this is a way where instead of pulling the cheek back and closing one eye and trying to look at a second molar and see how much you've reduced, there's three depth gauges here. There's one at one millimeter, 1 1.5 and two millimeters. I'm begging the company to make a 0 0.6 millimeter one for uh, minimal materials uh, like solid zirconia that can go that thin. But basically you just have the patient bite together. There's a mesial end and a distal end and the patient bites together and you can slide it through the mesial end and slide it out to the buccal and lingual to make sure you have enough room and the same with the distal. So my message, um, for all your customers at, at 38 Smiles is, come on, Dennis, we got to step our game up. We got to be a little better. Uh, 38 Smile scans every case, even if you send a polyvinyl impression and they pour it in stone and scan it to get it into the digital environment, all they have to do is click two spots, one on the opposing tooth and the prep to see exactly how much you reduced. You can't lie to this lab and say, I swear I reduced a millimeter and a half. No, we just clicked on these two things and you reduce 0.8 millimeters. We need to step our game up. Every lab out there is checking our homework now. So I want you to either do the reverse preparation technique with the depth cutters. If you can't do that because you're replacing an old crown, you can use the prep sure guides to see if you've reduced one, 1 1.5 or two millimeters. If you haven't, go back in and prep a little more and then go back in with the prep guides today. So I guess my final message is, there's just no excuse today for under-preparing a crown unless you're lazy or you simply don't care. And I hope neither of those is true. Uh, I think I've given you two easy ways to be able to implement a way to accurately reduce crowns depending on what material you prescribe and a technique for getting an almost perfect margin with very little effort, less effort than you've ever done before uh, for these margins. And then finally, on when you're doing redo dentistry, uh, some prep guides that can um, make sure you're still able to reduce even if you the right amount, even if you don't know how much the previous dentist reduced. So thank you, Mia, so much for giving me a few minutes to uh, spread the word uh, about this and give you guys a hand.